Kautilya's Arthashastra. The extent that there is discussion about governance, it is almost exclusively about the structure of governance. There's almost very little discussion on the issue of what were the principles of governance. What were the principles of governance? What were the intellectual frameworks and philosophical principles that of governance that our intellectual tradition talks about? आज के इंटरेस्ट ऑन गुडविल सोसाइटी ऑफ इंडिया के जस्टिस नगेंद्र सिंह मेमोरियल लेक्चर के की नोट स्पीकर श्री संजीव सान्याल जी किसी परिचय के मोहताज नहीं हैं श्री संजीव सान्याल इज करंटली ए मेंबर ऑफ द इकोनॉमिक एडवाइजरी काउंसिल टू द प्राइम मिनिस्टर ही वाज द प्रिंसिपल इकोनॉमिक एडवाइजर टू द फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर फॉर फाइव ईयर्स टिल फरवरी टू 22 and till co-chair of the G20's framework working group prior to joining the government he sent oh, he spent over two decades in financial markets and was global strategist and managing director of national bank an alumni of sri ram college of commerce delhi Mr Sanyal later attended Oxford University as a scholar he was awarded the Eisenhower fellowship in 2007 for his work on urban dynamics in 2010 he was named as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum Davos <laughs> Mr Sanyal is the author of a number of best selling books including land of seven rivers the ocean of church india in the age of ideas and the indian renaissance he has also published over 200 articles and columns in leading national and international publications jaisa ki maine sankshipt roop se sanyal saab ke bare mein aapko unka एक संक्षिप्त बायोडाटा प्रस्तुत किया जब आप उन्हें सुनेंगे तो जो आज का टॉपिक है जस्टिस नगेंद्र सिंह मेमोरियल लेक्चर के अवसर पर द इंडियन ट्रेडिशन ऑफ थॉट्स ऑन गवर्नेंस इस पर आपका उद्बोधन होगा और निश्चित रूप में हम सब उससे लाभान्वित होंगे जय हिंद जय भारत गुड इवनिंग फ्रेंड्स let me begin by thanking the international goodwill society of india for giving me this opportunity to deliver the justice nagendra singh memorial lecture for the year 2023 let me also thank the various luminaries on the stage uh, shri r k mathur shri bramdat dr yogendra narayan dr k c sharma and all of you of course for giving me this opportunity to speak about a topic uh, that would um, have perhaps been also very close to the heart of justice nagendra singh as you all know he was an ics uh, uh, officer a secretary to the president of india um, he was the chief election commissioner and then um, apart from being the indian representative to the un he was also the president of the international court of justice so the topic that i'm going to speak about which is about the theory of governance and india's tradition um is something i'm sure uh, he would have uh, definitely uh, been uh, happy about so you know india as you all know is a very old civilization 5 6 7 000 years as depending how you want to define it and not surprisingly during this long period we have done a lot of thinking a lot of experimentation um in the field of governance so there is actually a fairly rich literature going back a long long way there were early schools of thought uh, there were large amounts of uh, school uh, disagreement between those schools of thought so it's not as if it's a rigid um sort of framework and everybody agreed there were plenty of interesting uh, conversations uh, there were thinkers like the early schools um of uh, shukra and brihaspati and i'll come to those um there were ideas in the epics uh, 
there was Kautilya's Arthashastra, of course, which many of you will know about. But there were other writers too, which people have often forgotten, like Kamandak's uh, Nitisara, or much more recently, uh, the lectures delivered by Raja Madhav Rao to the young Sayaji Rao Gaikwad in the 19th century. So there's a very rich tradition. I have to be brief because this is a lecture, so you'll, um, uh, you'll forgive me for skipping a lot. But let me say that unfortunately, there's, there, you know, although this corpus of thought is so rich, there is um, relatively little um, written about the Indian thoughts of, on governance. Now, when I say this, I don't mean uh, that people have not written about, for example, the uh, Kautilya Arthashastra. Their whole library is about it. But you see, it is taken in isolation. And to the extent that there is discussion about governance, it is almost about the almost exclusively about the structure of governance. You know, were there ancient republics? Um, what were the layers of officialdom? Uh, Mansabdari, Jagirdari, and so on. There's almost very little discussion on the issue of what were the principles of governance? What was all this officialdom supposed to be doing? What are the end uh, objectives of governance that, um, um, that there are ancient thinkers all the way down to the 19th century had? And so my lecture is going to focus on this. What were the principles of governance? What were the intellectual frameworks and philosophical principles that, of governance that um, our intellectual tradition talks about? So to do that, let's go to the right to the beginning. And I'll, you'll see why perhaps this discussion didn't get started because so much of it is fragmentary. There are texts that are available only in bits and pieces. A lot of it requires guesswork. There are debates and, uh, and so on. So let's go back right to the beginning, um, to uh, the Bronze Age. And the history of the Bronze Age in India is, comes from two separate sources. And there's a fair amount of debate to this day on how these two things are linked. One of them is, one of these sources is the ancient Vedic texts, uh, particularly the Rig Veda, which is the oldest of the Vedic texts. Um, Again, debate about how old it is, but it's perhaps somewhere between uh, 4,000 and 5,000 or maybe even more old, years old. And then there is the archaeological remains of the Harappan civilization, uh, which is in the northwest of India. But now there are increasingly more archaeological sites from the Bronze Age, which are being found in the Gangetic Plains as well. Um, not far from here, uh, Bronze Age chariots have been found, for example, in Bagpat, in Sanoli, and so on. So again, there's a lot of archaeological sites that are popping up as well. The problem is there's a lot of uh, acrimonious, I think unnecessarily acrimonious debate about how these two are linked. And I'm not going to try and attempt to resolve this in today's lecture, except to say that both these traditions, when you dig into them, give you very little idea of how actually governance was carried out. So for example, the Rig Veda, uh, Obviously, it's a book on religious rituals, philosophy, and, and so on. It does give you some sense of this type of society that was there. But the sum of what we can tell from the Vedic texts about governance in that time is that we are dealing with relatively small tribal kingdoms, which were ruled over by chieftains. The chieftains were supported by two bodies. One was called the Samiti, which was a general body, and a Sabha, which was a more smaller executive council or, or, uh, or uh, advisory committee of some sort. We don't know exactly how this functioned, but it is interesting to see that the terms have actually switched in meaning. So today, when we talk about the Samiti, we usually mean an advisory committee. And when we say the word Sabha, we mean Lok Sabha or some larger gathering. So in some ways, the meanings have switched. But nonetheless, beyond this, we can tell very little about how Vedic uh, societies were governed. Now, when we turn to the archaeology of the Harappans, we have a similar problem. We all know that there was a lot of emphasis on municipal management, standardization, and so on. But how, who ran these things? Why did they standardize? What were the principles on which they ran these things? We have very little idea. Beyond saying that 
the fact that there was clearly an elite uh, in these societies, almost all the bigger cities tend to have an upper, upper uh, city uh, and there tends to have the public buildings, the somewhat better quality or larger uh, uh, dwellings and so on. So obviously these societies had some sort of elite. Um, and those of you who believe that the Vedic society is some sort of a subset of the Harappans would argue maybe this is where the Sabha and the Samiti would come and meet. But frankly, we know very little. So I'm sorry, we'll have to move on to the next stage to get into anything slightly meatier, and which is the Iron Age. Now, the Iron Age does provide us much more texts. This is the era of the epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And here we can see that the idea of the state has evolved to something much more concrete. So we have moved maybe a thousand or more years and the states are more embedded. Um, they are more uh, complex uh, idea of the state is there. And here in the epics, we hear about principles of governance a bit more often. In particular, you have the Raj Dharma Parva of the Mahabharat. Here you have, for example, Bhishma lying on the bed of arrows, uh, tells Yudhishthir, even as he is dying, about the principles of governance. So there is a whole Raj Dharma Parva where these principles are enunciated. You also see that in the Ramayana, in particularly the Balkand, where you know uh, the young Ram is taught about how to rule and he's given examples from his father's kingdom and so on. So some principles you get. The problem is that the way this information is provided is in the form of wise aphorisms. And clearly, I mean, some thought had gone into it, but if you take all of them, it is very difficult to create an internally consistent framework of principles. You know, there'll be the odd aphorism about taxation not being excessive, or about the king being restrained, about the importance of um, uh, uh, rule of law and so on. But can you put it all together and actually run a kingdom based on it? Very, very difficult. So uh, at the very least, it's not laid out in a nice textbookish sort of way, the way, for example, Kautilya's Arthashastra will be done in the next, gen next round. So you have to work quite hard to try and work out what their concepts of governance were. So, so the way to do it, one way to do it, is to go and look at what are the intellectual concepts that are there, which are underlying all of this. And one of the important intellectual concepts that exists in the Iron Age is the idea of Matsya Nyaya. So what is Matsya Nyaya? It is the law of the fish, in which the big fish eat the small fish. It's essentially the Indian version of the law of the jungle. And the purpose of the state is to avoid Matsya Nyaya. So this is an important concept and I'll come back to it. In the Indic tradition uh, of thought on governance, the avoidance of Matsya Nyaya is a very important idea. The other concept that comes up frequently is that a king must not rule his kingdom for himself, but for the betterment of the people. And that the best way to do this is to adhere to the principles of dharma. Now, it's also interesting here that there is no conception here of, say, the, the European idea, medieval idea of divine right. The right of the king to rule basically comes from the adherence to dharma and the betterment of people. He has no real divine right as such to rule. Now, putting all of these different ideas now you have a problem. What does dharma mean? Now this is unfortunately an extremely complicated concept, as you know, which is very difficult to translate. There's long discussions in both the epics about what this actually means. Uh, but may I say that in practice, what it meant is quite interesting. Now, according to Meenakshi Jain, who's a well-known historian, as you know, so Professor Jain says that one practical application of dharma principle was the acceptance of common practice, conventions, contracts, and rules. In, in effect, it is akin to common law. I, every group or every context had its own dharma. So in other words, this is again quite a different way of thinking about 
governance principles. The solution is very contextual. It is not one grand law that comes across. And evolving situations give evolving solutions. So therefore, this is not a time where something like a rigid social code, like a Dharma Shastra, uh, would come out as being a particularly good framework for running a state. As and when they may have existed, these did not exist as, the, as bodies of law for enforcement. So the Dharma Shastras, for example, should be seen as maybe opinions for reference. I don't think ever there was a kingdom or empire in India that was based on enforcing any Dharma Shastra. Nonetheless, there is, it is possible to work out, however, the interesting debates that, about governance that may have existed between the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And I'm going to give you one interesting instance which you may find interesting. It, at least I think, and I think I'll let you decide whether my interpretation is correct or not. But it seems to be that the two epics appear to be having a debate. What is this debate? So on one side you have the Ramayana, which makes the case that the word of the law and the enforcement of the contract is the single most important way to avoid Matsyanaya. So the word of the contract has to be applied. So you hear Prana Jai Par Bachanana Jai, right? That is the consensus. So you have throughout the Ramayana situations where Ram is having to adhere to contracts or laws which are blatantly unfair. He knows they are unfair, but he still adheres to them because the Ramayana is making the case that, look, without this, you will have Matsyanaya. Right? So, it's not the case that the Ramayana makes, is, is arguing that um, KK's demand was just. The Ramayan knows, Rama also knows that it is unjust. But a promise has been made and therefore it must be adhered to. And so this idea is so strong that the Ramayan itself is actually changed in various ways to enforce this point. So an entire section called the Uttar Ramayan is actually added at the end of Valmiki's Ramayan. By the way, Valmiki's original Ramayan did not include the Uttar Ramayan. It, the original Ramayan ends with... Ram and Sita returning to Ayodhya. That is the end of the original Ramayana. But an entire new section is added about what happens after Ram comes back and he rules his empire. And here, the whole point that seems to be enforced is that Ram has to enforce a law which pre-exists. He didn't create the law, it just happened to exist. But now that it exists, he has to enforce it. And he does not justify the sending away of Sita to this, to, to, to the forest. There's no attempt in Ramayana to justify it. It just says that this law exists and as Ram as the king has to enforce it. So this is an important point about Ram Rajya. Ram Rajya is not utopia. In Ram Rajya, Ram himself is actually utterly miserable. He's pining for his wife, he does not remarry, and he, he lives an, in a life of unhappiness. And quite guilty, if, if I may say so. But his people are happy and prosperous. And the point that is being made is that Ram Raji is a place where the rulers apply the law to themselves. That is the point that Ramayana is effectively making as a principle of governance. That is the way Matsya Nyaya is held in abeyance. The rulers too apply the laws to themselves. Now it turns out that Mahabharata does not agree with this. The Mahabharata, one of the key protagonists, protagonists, of course, is Yudhishthir. And Yudhishthir repeatedly tries to do the same thing that Ram does, adhere to all the laws, rules, contracts, and, and so on. But it doesn't lead to Ram Raj or happy, end, happy outcome. Repeatedly, it leads to, in fact, unhappy outcomes. And in fact, it culminates all the way in a great war, which is so destructive that it destroys Civil, almost destroys civilization itself. So the, so the Mahabharat makes a somewhat different point that simply blindly following the 
word of the law or applying the contract blindly and enforcing it does, is not the way to avoid matsya naya. You have to have some conception of the spirit of the law. You have to have some conception of natural justice. And so I have an interesting situation where Krishna, who is, by the way, an avatar of the same God, Vishnu, as Ram, right? He's, he's the same God. But he's come here, it's almost as if he came back to say, you know, we made that point, but there is another point to be made. And the point is, word of law is important, but the spirit of law is also important. And so you have this situation where Draupadi, since the since the her husbands have lost her in the game of dice, Draupadi is now a slave, and her new owners have a right to do what they wish with her. But there is no rule about the length of a sari. So Krishna takes this loophole, and you know, they're allowed to pull the sari, but the sari can be infinitely long. And so effectively, the law is this word of the law is enforced, but in some sense, natural justice is also done. And you see that repeatedly, whether, uh, uh, you know, Arjun avenging the killing of his son, for example, and so on and so forth uh, throughout the rest. So you can see this debate. Now, this debate between the word and spirit of the law has not been resolved to this day. It's a raging debate to this day. So I'm not saying the epics resolved this debate, but I'm just pointing out there were some interesting thoughts about governance that were already there. Now time passes for, forward and we are now into the late Iron Age and into coming into the historical period. Here now we begin to see new schools of thought emerging. So two import, there are many schools of thought, but two important schools of thought emerge out of this. One of the school, schools of Brihaspati, who was the guru of the Devas. And the other is the school of Shukra, who was the guru, guru of the Asuras. Now I want to make it very clear right up front that the idea of the Devas and the Asuras being good and bad is actually a much later idea. The original idea of the Devas and the Asuras is more like a yin and yang idea. They are the gods and the anti-gods and they are seen as being in somewhat in a tension, yes, but they both need each other. So for example, in the Samudra Manthan, both of them have to come to do the Samudra Manthan. So please don't confuse it with later ideas of good and bad. The Asuras and the Devas are both uh, different shades of grey, let's say. And here, you have the school of Shukra, which is the Asuric school, which is essentially making the case of Dandaniti. What is Dandaniti? Where they make the thing that the way to, to govern is effectively to create a set of sensible rules and to enforce those rules. That is the key to good governance, Dandaniti. That's the Shukra school, the Asuric school. And then there is the Brihaspati school, which agrees that Dandaniti is needed. But it states that you also need policy, particularly economic policy, Varta. So there is this debate that these two schools are having in coming into the early historical period. Unfortunately, there is a problem that while we know from other texts that this debate was there, we do not have any uncorrupted uncorrupt versions of either the Shukra uh, Nitisara or of the Brihaspati Sutra. So we have to guess at what was in these texts from other texts. There is no good copy of, an, uh, of, the, of the Brihaspati Sutra. It only survives as a fragment. Uh, the only thing I found was an English translation by Dr. F. W. Thomas, published in 1921, but it's just a fragment and it doesn't give any meaningful sense of the wider document or the underlying philosophy of governance. So, and the same problem is there with Shukra Niti Sara, which survives as a late medieval abridgment. Uh, there is an English translation by Professor Binoy Shorkar, uh, published in 1913. Uh, unlike the other text, it is not a fragment, so it's a, even the abridged version is a substantial text, but we can tell that it is a medieval abridgment and in fact it's very corrupted. Uh, so it's got things like, for example, it mentions gunpowder, it, it, it mentions uh, uh, what is possibly a gun, and all of these things clearly did not exist in, in, the, in the, the late Iron Age, 
So I don't think we should take them too seriously. And you also have Manusprithi, who is also another of the schools of the early period. And again, we have a later version of the text uh, from somewhere in 3rd, 4th century AD. So again, we have no idea what these texts originally meant other than other texts mentioned that this is what their arguments were. So this brings us to the one text which is genuinely clear about what the principles of governance are, which is Kautilya's Arthashastra. Now, Kautilya, Kautilya, who was Kautilya, is a very interesting character in his own right. His name was Vishnu Gupt Kautilya, otherwise known as Chanakya. We are in Chanakya Puri, so it is named after him. And he was a professor of political economy at Takshashila University at the time that Alexander invaded India. And he, he was very shocked by this. And so he made his way to Magad to ask for help from the Nandas and famously was insulted by the Nandas. So he came away back to Takshashila, bringing him with him a young student, Chandragupta Maurya, who he then taught to be the first great emperor of historically known emperor of India. So we are now talking about 322 BC, thereabouts when the empire was created. And of course, Kautilya along with Chandragupta are co-founders of this empire. So he's not just a theoretician and a professor. He was actually a founder of an empire. And although we do not know for sure whether his Arthashastra was actually used exactly to run this empire. Since the Arthashastra by most reckoning was already written before the empire was created. So I think it is reasonable to say that it must have been used at some, at least to some extent as a blueprint of how the first great empire, the Mauryan empire was run. And it is a very thick text. Unfortunately, the general discussions about it tend to focus about the Mandala theory about international relations and about spies and so on, they are actually a very small part of the text. Most of the text actually deals with municipal laws, taxation, urban management, legal system, military organization, and all kinds of different things. And it's very detailed in, all kind, in many, many ways. So here is a text which clearly has the principles laid down, and it starts by telling you what those principles of governance are. So right in the beginning, Kautilya states that he is not the, the, the origin of many of these ideas. So this is also interesting. So there is a conception of referencing already. So he starts the text right in the beginning with salutations to both Shukra and Brihaspati. So he is already telling you that he is drawing on pre-existing corpus of thought. And then he says that there are different schools of thought and different areas of knowledge. So what are the areas of knowledge that Kautilya lays out? that one must know in order to run a kingdom. So the first he says is Dandaniti, which is rule of law. Then he says Varta, which is policy, especially economic or commercial policy. Then he says Anivikshiki or philosophical frameworks. So to put it in a modern context, we, you could have a philosophical frameworks that we use today, socialism, capitalism, and so on. So philosophical frameworks. And Trai, which literally means the first three Vedas, but could be taken to mean more widely the general cultural context. And then he, Kautilya then says that he then lists out how the different schools of thought are different from each other. So he then says, as I already told you, that the school of Shukra is focused on Dandaniti. So basically he says good laws and their strict enforcement is the main tool of governance. But then he also says that if you overuse laws and excessively strict, then you say you you know you will get a rebellion and or and misuse. Then he says there is the school of Brihaspati, as I said, school of Brihaspati accepted Dandaniti, but they also emphasize Varta, which is it expected the state to use both law and economic policy interventions. Then he says there is the school of Manu. Manu accepted both Varta and Dandaniti, but it said that you needed Trai i.e. the cultural context. So <clears throat> the point he was making is that it's not good enough to have laws and policy. You only, the, the cultural context in which you apply it, you have to know something about. And then finally, Cortelia says, you also need to have a philosophical framework for thinking about policy. And then Cortelia says, I disagree with all the previous. I don't think you need 
one or the other you need all four areas of knowledge in order to be able to govern a, a, a kingdom properly now with this knowledge cortelia then goes on to make a case for a strong but limited state now this is important to understand cortelia is a realist okay he has no sense of humor about many things he is not an idealist at all he believes that the role of the state i e the king is to provide security from internal and external threats administer justice provide infrastructure and municipal services regulate and encourage commercial activity and to collect taxes the cortelian state does not allow for any, any laxity in this area so he has no sense of humor about these areas but on the other hand he is not wildly keen on extending the role of the state beyond these things so for example he is not a welfareist the role of the state in helping the poor etc yes it's needed but it's needed during emergencies like a natural calamity he thinks of the state essentially as a framework in which civilization functions he is not it's for the society to decide where it really wants to go the state is not state is there to provide the overall framework so the question is why is cortelia limiting the role of the state in this particular way now of course other intellectual traditions also have this business about li limiting the role of the state so in the western context of limiting the state the usual con reason that the western tradition talks about tends to derive its idea from about limiting the state in terms of the rights and freedoms of individuals right so the state needs to be limited because of the rights innate rights and freedoms of individuals but it's quite interesting that in cortelia's approach he has a very indian reasoning for doing this the problem of corruption and misuse of power and so he repeatedly talks about his suspicion of the states you all know about cortelia's suspicion and use of spies etc what is interesting is that this is not directed at the citizens almost all of it is directed either at the enemies of the state but a lot of it is towards government officials and in fact he states very clearly that it is no more possible to mo monitor the official corruption than it is to measure how much water a fish is drinking so in fact he states it explicitly in this way just as it is impossible to know when a fish is drinking water while it is swimming so it is impossible to find out when government servants misappropriate money right so now let me show you he how he applies this in varta so this is the principle how does he apply this to say economic policy i am an economic advisor how would he apply this to economic policy well he says that the king shall promote trade and commerce by setting up trade routes by land and by water as well as market towns and ports trade routes shall be kept free from the harassment of courtiers state officials thieves frontier guards and from being damaged by herds of cattle now since cortelli is one of my intellectual heroes i am rather concerned that as a as a serving civil servant his opinion of me was that i was somewhere between a thief and a herd of cattle but that's as it may be now cortelia then lays out all kinds of strict regulations for example many of his ideas would go against many of the conceptions you may have about him for example he was totally against prohibition his idea was very much about regulation of vices regulate prostitution regulate production and consumption of alcohol but he was totally against prohibiting these things and it he doesn't state it but my sense is because he always is suspicious of officials that if you ban something they will take advantage of it now what you can see here is that cortelia's arthashastra puts forward a no nonsense realist approach to governance his exact measures of course are not valid today i mean i don't want to use his exact rules traffic rules for bullock carts today would not make sense but his principles to a large extent can be utilized even today so i think it's quite extraordinary and it certainly is the case that 
he set up an empire it was well functioning at least during the period of Chandragupta and his son Bindusara so at least for two generations a large empire was run using these principles and run well but that doesn't mean that everybody agreed with him so when we reach the, the, the generation the third generation of the empire there is actually an Ashokan rebellion so let me tell you about Ashoka's rebellion what happens is that in the year 274 BC, Bindusara suddenly dies. And the crown prince, Tsushima, who is the, supposed to take over the crown, is far away in the northwest. So there is a palace coup in which a lesser known prince called Ashok, who was not supposed to be the next ruler, suddenly captures power. He essentially eliminates all his brothers and all other male claimants to the throne. And uh, all, all ministers who oppose him, uh, possibly with the help of Greek mercenaries. And then when Tsushima gets back to the capital, he basically has him killed in the moat of the entry to Pataliputra. So this is how Kote, uh, Ashoka comes to capture the throne. The story goes that he is initially very, very cruel, but then he invades Kalinga. And shocked by his own cruelty, he becomes a Buddhist and a pacifist. Now, I've written about this more extensively in other places, but let me just put it out here. Uh, there is almost no evidence uh, of this story of his conversion to Buddhism and pacifism. The evidence, to the extent we have any, clearly suggests that he was already a Buddhist before he became king, perhaps. And that even after Kalinga, he did not become a pacifist. He continued to carry out many invasions, massacres, etc. well after Kalinga. So this story of his pacifism is, I'm sorry to say, a late 19th century or early 20th century uh, invention to fit in with various political ideologies of that time. Um, the, historical uh, 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 the, the historical evidence basically considers him Chanda Ashoka or Ashoka the Cruel. Now I'm going, not going to go into what he actually did, because my discussion today is about his principles of governance. Here too, interestingly, he was a rebel. And he makes very significant uh, deviations from Ashoka's um, uh, strong but limited state. Now, how do I know about this? Well, by reading his edicts. So, look at what he does. You have here... Chanakya, he's, you see, what was Cortilia's king? Cortilia's king is basically a self-restrained enforcer of the law, right? That's what he is. But Ashoka declares himself the following. All men are my children. He then goes further to literally argue for a welfarist na nanny state. He says, just as a parent entrusts his child to a wet nurse, the Rajukka officials have been appointed by me for the welfare and happiness of the people. Now, people will, now, here, all of you will appreciate that this is a completely different opinion of government officials. I mean, Cortelia would never have approved of the expansion of the state, and he would certainly not be talking about trusting the officials to be uh, the wet nurses to the people. And you, he goes on, Ashoka. He says, he creates all these large numbers of rules and regulations. So if you go through Ashoka, he's a very realist, limited rules, clear what he's trying to do. But here you have Ashoka coming up with these kind of rules, which are clearly uh, sort of welfareist uh, interventions into daily life. So here is another example of one of his rules. He says, in the eighth day of every fourth night, in the 14th and 15th of Tissa, Purva, Purnavasu, the, th the three Chaturmasis and the other auspicious days, bull are not to be castrated. Goats, rams, boars and other animals that are to be castrated are not to be. On Tissa, Purnavasu and the fortnight of Chaturmasi, horses and bullocks are not to be branded. Now, I, as you can see, this is a very big difference with the practical rule making of the Arthashastra. I mean, if you had, if Kautilya had remained alive, he would have argued, what difference does it make to the bull what day of the month he is castrated? 
So you can see a very different an opinion. And then Ashoka goes on about the expansion of the state. He's, he, he expands the purview of the state into creating a cadre of something called the Dharma Mahamantas, which are basically the religious police. And they are given the job of going to people's houses and making sure that they are all following the Dharma and being pious and you know uh, doing good deeds. And although Ashoka goes at pains to say that you know his Dharma Mahamantas uh, do not enforce uh, Buddhist religious laws on other groups, and he's quite he's quite explicit at being uh, respectful towards non-Buddhists. The very fact that such social control uh, existed, I would argue, is quite quite worrying. And what happens as a result of this expansion of the state? Well, while Ashoka is still alive, this expansion of the state leads to a large fiscal crisis. And we know that the empire begins to crumble while Ashoka is still around. So the Mauryan empire essentially big, sort of spirals into this fiscal crisis with open conflict within the royal house, household. And then the central government's grip on the empire begins to collapse. And thus, we know that with the shift from Cortelia's strong but limited state to Ashoka's weak but all-pervasive all state, it ended in all in tears. Within a few years of Ashoka's death, the Mauryan Empire collapsed and fell apart. Thus, India's first experiment with big government ended in tears. This is the historical evidence that we have of our experimentation with governance systems. Now from here on, for the next several centuries, Kautilya's Arthashastra becomes now the dominant uh, text that is much debated. It appears everywhere. Clearly, people have this nostalgia for the great empire and this book that was used to sort of run this empire. So centuries pass away. You still see other texts appearing, being debated. There are new texts that I mentioned, Dharma Shastras, for example, that appear as well. Um, you have the Manu school and the Manu, Manu Smriti. But they are all more or less, as far as I can tell, all about personal laws. So they include laws related to the caste system, which is increasingly, by the way, becoming rigid. But they don't really, at least to the extent I can tell, introduce the intellectual framework for governance or economic management in quite the same way as the Arthashastra. So in my way, and my view, at least from perspective of governance, they are definitely inferior texts. So you really have to wait till the Gupta period when another empire rises where a new text is written in the same sort of strain. And this is Kamandak's Niti Sara. And it's important here to remember that the Guptas very much modeled themselves on the Mauryas. The memory of the Mauryas was still there. There's a six centuries later, by the way. There's 600 years difference between the Mauryas and the Guptas. But the Guptas very much remember about the Mauryas. So at least two of their major kings Chand are named Chandragupta. So, you know, uh, many of the things they do are clearly inspired by uh, the Mauryan idea. The, you know, Samadra Gupta goes all the way down to South India to, uh, you know, conquer the southern tip of India to re-establish these ideas. And of course, this shows through, this admiration uh, shows through in art and culture. So there is this very famous um, uh, play called Mudra Rakshas from the Gupta period, which talk, talks about the how Chanakya took over the Nan Nanda Empire. So, you know, so there's a lot of sort of, just like today we kind of look back to them, the, the, the Guptas were looking back to the Mauryas. So in that spirit, you have this thinker called Kamandak, who writes a book called Niti Sara. Niti Sara basically means um, uh, if you, uh, the essence of policy making. I, so that, I would translate it as that. So we don't really know who Kamandak is. Um, he was either a scholar who was very connected to the, go to the government of the time, or a court official, or both of some sort. But he is not from the early period of the empire. He is clearly about when the empire has already been well established because you can clearly see uh, certain things that creep up in the way he thinks. For example, he rather likes aristocrats. And so Chanakya is much more open to merit because he, you know, he's created an empire. So he, is, he likes new talent, so to speak. 
neat kamandak on the other hand has a love for you know well born aristocrat so there are certain subtle differences but nevertheless kamandak's neeti sara then starts right in the beginning just like kotelli had started by talking about uh, shukra and rihaspati in the same way kamandak starts by salutations to vishnu gupt kotelli so you can see the links and then he talks about how, he talks right in the beginning about the role of kotelli in helping chandragupta build the empire and given his obvious admiration for kotelli it shouldn't be surprising that kamandak broadly reiterates many of kotelli's ideas so <clears throat> of course it's a shorter text and the niti sara uh, has some pref- preference for military uh, 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 and international affairs type of si- side of things so he really gets into more of that um, so he he it's not quite as useful as the arthashastra on governance type issues but to the extent he talks about them you can see a reiteration of many of kotelli's uh, uh, ideas however ashoka's welfareist ideas may not have entirely been lost so this is also quite interesting so in between all this reiteration of kotelli's ideas niti sara also adds a f- couple of s- sentences uh, which sound strangely ashokan so let me give you one of them he has a sentence there uh, where he states nursing the tenderest compassion in his heart and without deviating from the path of dharma a king should wipe wipe away the tears of the oppressed and the helpless now this sounds rather ashokan um and even if uh, i don't know what it, what it actually meant in practice at the very le- least it means that by kamandak's time um even if they hadn't in- incorporated this idea of direct welfareist intervention at the very least it meant that the political establishment now was using some what softer words than uh, kotelli's dry realist kind of language now of course between that time afterwards there are many many texts and the sad part is the very very few of them are are either translated or the or in in the public domain and have not been properly studied now my sense is there must be many more texts after all after after um the the kamandak's works there are there must have been many other texts written the problem is there hasn't been adequate amount of hunting for them there are literally 4 lakh texts lying around with the national manuscript mission which haven't been properly looked into and, and to the extent they're looked into they tend to be sanskritists and grammarians who tend to dig into all of this uh, not economists um and this is something a complaint i've made to my mentor and colleague um who is also a sanskritist dr vivek debroy uh and so we are hoping that we'll try and create some way of digging into this and looking for new texts but there is a long gap after this about good texts that we can bite our teeth into there are commentaries by others uh, there are uh, abridgments as i said of the shukra nitisara but there are no new ideas so to speak that you can really stick your teeth into and this is also a problem by the way of the uh, medieval period and after the arrival of the uh, islamic rulers uh, there is um, obviously new ideas coming from the islamic schools uh, many of them are imported into india many indigenous hindu ideas are also incorporated into this uh, but again we don't have a text like the arthashastra which delineates the rules and principles of governance what you do have is things like abu fazal's any akbari so i'll give you use it as an example it's two thick volumes lots of description of the times about history about the layers and functionaries the mansabdari system and so on but it doesn't tell you exactly what the mansabdari uh, mansab uh, other than you know making sure they had the right requisite number of horsemen etc it doesn't tell you what exactly they are supposed to be doing as far as governance is concerned now it's possible if someone really goes in there and does some research again to create some um some draw out some principle just like i did it with the epics it's possible to draw out uh, principles of governance but somebody has to do this work so maybe somebody in so both for the early medieval period this is the post gupta period and for the islamic period if there are scholars here who want to uh, go in there either to look for new texts that maybe there are texts i don't know about or to 
do the hard work of d digging through texts like Annie Akbari and try and figure out these principles of governance. So somebody was willing to do that, please do so. We have same problem, by the way, with the Maratha period. We do have Ramchandra, Amatya Ramchandra Pant's uh, Ajna Patra. Uh, but again, it's a very short text. It tells you lists of layers of governance, of uh, officials and so on. Um, there seems to a vague sense that it may have been inspired by the Arthashastra, but again, not enough detail to be able to really draw out principles of governance. So you really have to skip all the way to the 19th century to find another attempt done in this way. And you find here an attempt done in the 19th century by Raja Madhavarao called the Hints at the Art and Science of Government. This is really a set of lectures done in the 1880s. And these were a le set of lectures by Raja Madhav Rao to Sayaji Rao Gaikwad, the young Maharaja of Baroda. Now Madhav, who is Madhav Rao? He was a scholar and he was a Diwan, i.e. Prime Minister, of several princely states, including Travancore, Indore and Baroda. And in these lectures, he brings together both ancient ideas uh, of upholding dharma. But by this time, remember, many modern European ideas are also finding their way into the conversation. So he's also bringing in here the modern idea of limited sovereignty, for example. So, for example, by, you have to remember that the instructions he's given, it's not just the limited sovereignty, i.e. the idea of a limited monarch, which, of course, comes from the British tradition of limited monarchy, but also the context that the Indian princely states were further limited by the fact that you had the overarching colonial rule, architecture around them. So these instructions are given in the context of British colonial overlordship as well. So Rao, interestingly, for example, warns the young prince against taking on the mighty empire. So, you know, very different from the context of Kautilya, who is the creator of our empire. Here, Madhav Rao is saying, you know, don't pick a fight with these guys. Um, so he, that's one of the things he's trying to tell you. But at the same time, he's also uh, uh, interesting, as an aside, since he's telling a young teenager, presumably, about the principles of, uh, of governance, while he's instructing them, note the impact on Sayaji, because Sayaji would grow up to be one of the most subversive uh, princely uh, rulers uh, of any Indian state, princely state, because he would... Um, do many, many things, not the least support people like uh, uh, Aurobindo Ghosh, later Sri Aurobindo, uh, to set up, uh, for example, the revolutionary movement in many subtle ways. So he would be quite a rebellious character in his own right. But nevertheless, since we are here about Madhav Rao's text, well, in Madhav Rao's text at least, he warns the young prince not to pick fights with the British. He also instills in the king, the idea of being the sort of practice self-restraint. This is an idea that comes throughout all the text, you know, idea of self-restraint of the king. The state must be self-restrained. You keep seeing this. But not just, but here he's not the self-restraint enforcer of the law. Because by this time, by the way, another innovation has happened because the prince, the princely states by now have an independent judiciary. So the prince's role is no longer being the self-restraint enforcer of the law because there is an info independent judiciary already in place and Rao therefore states, now we have succeeded in establishing in these territories a set of judicial tribunals such as the country requires. The judicial tribunals have been working well and fulfilling their objects. Let me inform your highness of the clear result of my study and experience, namely, that any Maharaja who undertakes to administer public justice personally must inevitably fail. So you can see how the thoughts have evolved over time till the 19th century. Now, with, now that Dandaniti has been taken away, so what does Rao want the young Sayaji to do? Well, the only thing now left for him to do was to pay attention to Varta, which is policy. So Sayaji is encouraged to do the following things public works and infrastructure, commerce and industry, education and health. So it is with this advice then eventually that Baroda would become one of the better run public states in India. And to this day, the, what it was originally the Baroda state is even now um, taking advantage of many of the investments done at the time of Sayaji uh, 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 Gaikwad. Incidentally, 
Rao had also been the Prime Minister of another state, Travancore, where many of these things were also true. Of course, as I mentioned, Sayaji was quite rebellious, uh, uh, and he interpreted something that Rao told him in an interesting way. So Rao um, is quite interesting, but one of the in sort of advice that he gives to Sayaji is that he must attract talent to the Baroda princely uh, civil service. So he states, there is a large demand in British India for educated and upright men. And the remuneration that we pay must not be less than what the British government of offers. So Baroda was quite interesting. They were willing to match the, the salaries of the ICS at that time. And this would lead Sayaji to end up supporting many outstanding individuals. I, of course, mentioned uh, uh, Aurobindo Ghosh, who was the, one of the founders of India's freedom struggle, but of course also Bhimrao Ambedkar. To conclude, now, I have, I think, spoken for quite some time, uh, that India does have a very long and rich history of thinking about principles of governance as distinct from the form of government, which I didn't discuss at all here. This short essay and lecture uh, attempts to provide a brief overview of this history. Uh, the main debates, the principal characters, uh, we, we also see that there is this sense of continuity in these things. So, Kautilya references Shukra, Manu and Brihaspati, why Kamandak then uh, mentions Kautilya and so on. And as even as we deal with the fragmentary and whatever texts we have, we see there are concepts like Raj Dharma, which are mentioned in Iron Age texts in the Mahabharata, in the epics, as I mentioned, but then also turn up in the 19th century with Madhav Rao's lectures. So this is a very long tradition, and I hope that future generations of Indians will also partake on this generation, and not only will they partake in it, will also take forward this tradition and now write new Niti Saras and new Arthashastras. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Jai Hind.